In this lecture, we're going to introduce a new data type, specifically to deal with symbols. This may sound a bit odd, but if you step back and think about it, you may realize that everything we've done so far in the course has focused on procedures to manipulate numbers. While we've used names for things, we've treated them as exactly that, names associated with values. Today we're going to create a specific data type for symbols and see how having the notion of a symbol as a unit to be manipulated will lead to different kinds of procedures. To set the stage for this, recall what we've done when we deal with data abstractions. We said a data abstraction in essence consisted of a constructor for building instances of the abstraction, selectors or accessors for getting out the pieces of an abstraction, a set of operations for manipulating the abstraction while preserving the barrier between the use of the abstraction and the internal details of the representation, and most importantly, a contract specifying the relationship between the constructor and selectors and their behaviors. For example, if I want to create an abstraction for manipulating points in the plane, I could create a constructor like this. MakePoint is a procedure that glues two things together into a list. And here is one of the associated selectors, which in this case takes a data object as built by the constructor and pulls out the first or x-coordinate part of that object. Given that I can build objects of this type, I can define operations on them. Notice that the key point about these things is that they use the selectors to get at the pieces of the data object. For example, in this case, we do not use car to get the piece of the object. We use the defined selector. And then the key piece, the contract, the thing that relates the constructor and selectors together. For this example, the contract states that however we glue pieces together using the constructor, applying the first selector to that result will cause the value of the first piece to be returned. So, with these ideas of abstractions in mind, let's turn to introducing a new kind of data structure. Let's motivate why we need a new data type. Suppose I ask you the following question. Think for a second about how you might respond. I personally would probably respond by saying blue. Now, what about this question? If you are thinking carefully about this, you ought to respond by saying your favorite color. So, we say two different things in response to these two questions. What's the difference in the questions? If you think carefully about it, you should see that in the first case, I got the meaning associated with the expression, your favorite color, much like getting the value associated with the name. In the second case, I got the actual expression. The double quotation marks in the second case indicated that I wanted the actual expression, while in the first case, I wanted the value associated with it, that is, the actual favorite color versus the phrase favorite color. So in many cases, we may want to be able to make exactly this kind of distinction between the value associated with an expression and the actual symbol or expression itself. This is going to lead us to introduce a new kind of data. Now, the next question is, how do I create symbols as data structures or data objects? Well, we already saw one way of doing this, when we defined a name for a value. And we saw that if we wanted to get back the value associated with that symbol or name, we could just reference it, and the evaluator would return the associated value. But suppose I want to reference the symbol itself. How do I do that? In other words, how do I distinguish between your favorite color and blue as the value of your favorite color? Basically, we need to back up and think about what the scheme interpreter is doing. When we type in an expression and ask for it to be evaluated, the reader first converts that expression into an internal form, and the evaluator then applies its set of rules to determine the value of the expression. Here, we need a way of telling the reader and evaluator that we don't want to get the value. Scheme provides this for us with a special form called quote. If we evaluate the example expression using this special form, it returns for us a value of the type symbol that somehow captures that name. Note that it makes sense for quote to be a special form. We can't use normal evaluation rules because that would cause us to get the value associated with the name alpha, but in fact our goal is to simply keep the name, not its value. So what kind of object is a symbol? We can think of it as a primitive data object. Hence, it doesn't really have a constructor selectors, though quote serves to help us distinguish between the symbol and its value. It does, however, have some operations. In particular, the predicate symbol question mark takes in an object of any type and returns true if that object is a symbol. The operation eq question mark is used to compare two symbols, among other things, and we're going to return to that in a second. So here is our new data type for creating symbols, that is, data objects that refer to the name itself rather than the value with which it is associated. To see how this data structure is handled, let's go back to our two worlds view of evaluation, separating the visible world of the user from the internal execution world of computation. 
What happens when we consider symbols in this context? First, remember what happened when we evaluated other expressions. For example, if the expression were a lambda expression, then the evaluator checked the type of this expression, realized it was a special form, a lambda, and used the rule for that particular special form. In this case, it would create the compound procedure represented by that expression and return a pointer to that created object, causing the computer to print out information identifying that pointer, that is, some value associated with such a structure. Something different happens with quotes. If we type in an expression involving the special name quote, the evaluator checks the type of this expression, recognizes the special form, and uses a rule designed for such special expressions. In the case of quote, we simply take the second sub-expression and create an internal representation for it. The reader recognizes this as a sequence of characters and creates a symbol with that sequence of characters, like a name. The evaluator then returns to the visible world something to print out, simply the name that we just quoted, beta in this case. Now that we have the ability to create this new kind of data object, note that we can use it anywhere we would expect to use such primitive things. For example, we can certainly create a list of normal things like numbers. Remember that creating the list of 1 and 2 returns a printed representation of that list structure, written as open paren 1, 2, close paren. But I could also create a list of quoted things. We evaluate the arguments to list, getting two symbols, and then create the list of those symbols, finishing with the printed representation of the structure created by gluing those symbols together. What does that list look like? Well, list creates a box and pointer structure, just as in the case of numbers. Thus, at the top level of that structure, we will have a skeleton containing two things, ending in the special empty list symbol. And what hangs off this spine? A pointer to the data structure of a symbol. Thus, we can use symbols in the same places we might have earlier used numbers within other data structures. In fact, our scheme evaluator is smart, and it keeps track of what symbols have been created so far. As a consequence, when we refer to a symbol, Scheme gives us a pointer to the unique instance of that symbol. We can illustrate that as shown by evaluating this expression. This will create a list of two elements, both of which happen to be the symbol delta. Scheme will create a box and pointer structure for a two-element list. But the car of both cons pairs in this list now point to exactly the same object inside of the machine, namely the data structure for the symbol delta. This is valuable because it gives us a way of creating predicates for testing equality of symbols, and indeed of other more complicated objects, as we're going to see in a little bit. Our predicate for testing equality of symbols is EQ. This is a very powerful procedure used to test equality of a range of structures, as we're going to see. EQ is a primitive procedure, that is, it's something built into scheme, and it returns the Boolean value true if its two arguments are the same object. For our context, that says that since we create only one instance of each symbol, using EQ to test the quality of symbols, we re will return true if the two expressions evaluate to a pointer to the same symbol data structure. Here is an example of what we mean by that. If we apply EQ to two arguments that evaluate to the same symbol, we get a true value returned. Otherwise, a false value is returned. As an aside for those who are interested, here is the type of EQ. It accepts two arguments of any type, and returns a Boolean value of true if those two arguments evaluate to the same object. This works great if our two arguments are symbols, but care should be taken when applying this to other types, particularly numbers and strings. For example, the behavior of EQ is unspecified when passing two number expressions or two string expressions. We have a separate procedure for numbers, equal sign, to test equality, and a different procedure, string equal sign, to test equality of strings. There are also other predicates for testing equality with nuances of behavior which we will consider later, including EQV and equal. This now completes our method for creating and dealing with symbols. Having the ability to intermix numbers and symbols and expressions is a very useful thing. As a consequence, we'd like to be able to generalize this to all sorts of data structures. Since our primary data structure is a list, it would be nice if we had the ability to quote list structure in addition to simple names. In fact, our reader and evaluator will do this for us. Since the fundamental representation of expressions in our language is in terms of lists and list structure, the reader is set up to convert every typed in expression into list structure. This is true for any expression created out of parentheses, which denote the boundaries of the lists. As we'll see in a few lectures, the evaluator is then set up to take that list structure and manipulate it according to the rules of evaluation to determine the meaning of the expression. In the case of the special form quote, however, the evaluator simply passes on the list structure without any evaluation. 
Thus, in general, quoting a printed representation of a list structure, including sublists of numbers and symbols, gets converted to the appropriate list structure internally and then returned. Its printed representation will then match the original expression. This is nice because quote now lets us distinguish between names of things and their values for virtually every kind of structure. Of course, writing out long expressions involving this special symbol quote is a bit tedious, so we have a nice shorthand in scheme, namely the single quote mark. Thus, quote mark A is just a shorthand for open paren quote A, close paren, and quote mark open paren 1, 2, close is just a shorthand notation for open paren quote 1, 2, close, which we already saw creates for us a list consisting of the number 1 and the number 2. This means in general that placing a single quote mark in front of the printed representation for any list structure will cause the evaluator to create the corresponding list structure. So let's take a quick break to see if you're getting this idea. Here are our set of expressions. What gets printed out as a result of evaluating each of these? When you think you have the answers, go to the next slide. So here are the solutions. First, notice that we've defined x to have the value 20, creating a pairing of that value with that name. Evaluating the first expression just gives us a normal combination, resulting in the addition to 3 to the value of x, or giving us 23. The next expression, the single quote, says to just return a list whose printed representation is equivalent to this. That is, the list of quote plus, quote x, and quote 3. Or, if you like, the list of the symbol plus, the symbol x, and the number 3. Thus, what is printed out is the same expression as what was quoted. The next expression draws a distinction with this example. It says to create a list of a quoted plus, the value of x, and the quoted value of 3. Thus, we get a list of the symbol plus, because we quoted it, the number 20, since we asked for the value of x, and the number 3. The next expression returns the same value, since quoting a number just returns the number. Finally, what happens if we just ask for a list of plus x and 3? Well, we get a list of the values of each of those expressions, as shown. Thus, these examples show the variations in the use of quotation within list structure, determining when the values of expressions are returned and when the names are simply returned. Let's take the idea of symbols and combine it with some of the other lessons we've seen so far to see how symbols add to the expressive power of our language. To do this, we're going to look at the example of symbolic differentiation, in particular, creating a system to compute symbolic derivatives. By that, I mean returning symbolic expressions, much as you do in calculus. Thus, I want a system that takes some representation for the algebraic expression x plus 3 and some representation for the variable x and returns the derivative of that expression with respect to that variable. To do this, I'm going to need a way of representing expressions, which I will do using lists. Thus, the algebraic expression x plus 3 I choose to represent as the list open paren plus x3 close paren. That is, a list of the symbol plus, the symbol x, and the number 3. For base cases, I will just represent a variable by its symbol. Products I'll represent in a similar fashion. And given an expression involving more than two terms, I will break into recursive pieces, each of which involves at most two terms. Thus, I'm going to restrict my system to sums and products of at most two terms. I haven't said how to build the system, of course, but only how I'm going to represent expressions in my system. As we've already said, we would like to build a procedure deriv that takes as input some representation of an algebraic expression and a representation of the variable with respect to which we want to take the derivative and returns a representation of the new expression that represents that derivative. So, for example, here's the behavior I would like. I would like to differentiate x plus 3 with respect to x and get back the value 1. Notice the use of the single quote to indicate that I want the list structure itself as the value of the argument creating a representation of the algebraic expression. Thus, we want our system to take a symbolic algebraic expression as input and retune a new symbolic algebraic expression as output, satisfying the rules of calculus. To build this system, I'm going to stitch together several ideas, using lists of lists to represent expressions, using symbols to capture algebraic expressions, and using procedural abstractions to manipulate the list structures corresponding to those expressions. To build the system, I'm going to consider several stages, focusing on how to initially get things going, then on how to build a direct implementation, and finally how to learn from the direct method to create a better implementation. Throughout, we will see how these ideas of data structures and procedural abstractions work together to implement our system. We can observe several useful things about what we've done. First, note that E1 and E2 might themselves be complex expressions, in which case we would apply these rules again to each of those pieces.
Thus, our procedure will need to recursively walk down those expressions, applying rules to subsequent pieces. Second, as we noted, the derivative of a sum is decomposed into simpler versions of the same problem on smaller pieces, plus a simple operation that puts the results back together. Putting these two observations together, we can see that expressions might not be lists, but lists of lists, sometimes called trees, of arbitrary depth. That is, we can apply these rules to expressions whose parts are themselves sums or products of elements who might be sums or products, and so on. We simply want to recursively apply the rules to break the problem down into simpler pieces until we ultimately reach primitive cases, then glue all the parts back together again. Given our suggestion that we can represent expressions as lists of things, that is, lists of sub-expressions with the symbol for the operator at the front of the list and the arguments behind it, we can nicely associate a data type with each expression. First, any symbol will represent a variable. Any number will simply denote a constant. And then any other expression denotes its type by the object at the front of the list. Thus, any expression beginning with a plus is a sum, and thus will be subject to the rule for derivatives of sums, similarly for products. And of course, the sub-expressions could themselves be lists whose type is indicated by the type of the first part of the list. In other words, except for our primitive expressions, constants and variables, every expression in our system has its type defined by the first sub-expression of the list. This also excludes some kinds of expressions that might be perfectly valid from an algebraic perspective. Thus, expressions with the operator in the middle are not included in our choice of representation. Also, we've restricted ourselves for convenience to expressions with exactly two arguments. Algebraic expressions with more than two parts will have to be represented by nested lists of operations. Note that we are simply making some design choices in our system, something we are free to do so as we set up the st computational structure for implementing that system. Our choice is to allow legal expressions consisting of constants, variables, or lists of three elements, the first of which is either a plus or a star, and the other two of which are legal expressions by this definition. So let's formalize this with a type description for our legal expressions in this simple little language of derivatives that we're building. In our system, an expression, which we denote by EXPR to distinguish them from more general scheme expressions, this expression can either be a simple expression or a compound one. The slash symbol denotes OR, by the way. And what are those? Well, a simple expression is either a type number or symbol, corresponding to our constants and variables. A compound expression now has a very particular type. It is a list of three elements, where the first element is either that symbol plus or star, and the other two parts are expressions as defined by this type expression. Note the format for specifying that this is a list of three elements by using our type notation for pairs. Also note how this type definition is recursive, thus automatically allowing for arbitrary depth expressions. So now we can put together an initial plan for implementing the system. Since we only have a few kinds of expressions, the easiest approach is to use a different procedure to take the derivative of each kind of expression. So we could define deriv to be a procedure, note the lambda, that accepts an expression and a variable, represented using the forms we just discussed, and checks to see if the expression is a simple one. If so, we could have one procedure for handling such expressions. Otherwise, we could design a second procedure to handle the compound ones. Thus, we have used the fact that there are two general types of expressions to design our procedure. All we have to do is decide what it means for an expression to be simple. For that, we can just look at the type. What do we know about these expressions? Well, we know that a compound expression is a list, hence starts with a pair, and none of our simple expressions is a pair. To, to, so, to find a simple expression, we could simply confirm that the expression is not a pair. Now we can start completing the implementation by filling in the cases. The first branch deals with simple expressions. And here we can simply set up a branch to deal with each specific type. Since there are only two types of simple expressions, we can just check to see if we're dealing with a number, say, in which case we will apply the appropriate rule. Otherwise, we'll apply, apply the rule for variables. And how do we handle each simple case? We simply go back to our rules from our problem design and description. We said the derivative of a constant or number was just zero, so we can simply fill in that case. We said the derivative of a variable was 1 if it was the same variable as that with respect to which we were differentiating, otherwise it was 0. To fill in that case, we just need to test if the expression is the same variable as the supplied variable, and for that we use EQ, since our variables are represented as symbols. And that is all we need to handle simple expressions. For compound expressions, we can use exactly the same design methodology. We can have a different branch of this top-level decision procedure for each type of expression. Since we only have two types of compound expressions, we could simply check to see if the expression is a sum or not. 
to see if the compound expression is a sum, we'll just grab the first sub-expression, using car since we know it's the list, and test to see if it is the symbol plus by comparing using EQ. Note the use of the quote mark to give us the symbol plus for the comparison. Based on that decision, we will either handle the expression as a sum or as a product. We can keep working our way through the implementation. For example, to deal with sum expressions, we can go back to what our formal math analysis said. In particular, we need to take the derivatives of the sub-expressions then add them together symbolically. To do this, we take the catter of the expression, which gets out the first part of the sum, and apply derivative to it to get back the symbolic derivative. We do the same thing with the other part of the sum. If we implement derivative correctly, this should recursively return symbolic expressions for each part. Then, to create the symbolic sum, we need to convert the result to the appropriate form, namely a list with the symbol plus at the front. Notice how derivative thus decomposes the problem into simpler versions of the same problem and then constructs a new form to return based on these parts. So now let's try it out using the example of the derivative of plus xy with respect to x. Instead of getting what we might expect mathematically, namely 1, we get back the list plus 1, 0. Technically, these are the same thing, but the return form is not as satisfying as just returning the simplest possible form of this expression. Notice why this happens. Our procedure always blindly breaks out the pieces of a sum, applies derivative, and then glues things back together. It doesn't try to simplify the result. The underlying reason, which often happens in direct implementations of methods, is that the list structure of the input expression will be exactly preserved in the output. We simply replace the expression at each leaf of that list with the expression's derivative. What if instead we wanted our system to simplify things to more basic terms, thus not preserving the list structure of the input expression? We'll consider that question in the next section. But first, let's pull out the key lessons we've seen in taking a direct approach to implementing a system. First, in almost any system, our program will change after our initial design. In this case, we made an assumption that we didn't realize, namely that the structure of the input list would be preserved. We didn't observe this till we ran some test cases, which is often true in real systems. And now we need to go back and try and change our code to reflect a better design. But this is hard in this case, mostly because our code as it stands is hard to read. That is, to figure out which parts of the code are handling which parts of the problem. Moreover, suppose we want to add new expressions to our system, things other than sums or products. This is hard to do because we've built our code explicitly on the assumption that there are two choices for each expression. And suppose we decide that we want to change the representation of our expressions, for example, to put the operator in the middle, more like real algebraic expressions. This is hard to do because we've used the actual list selectors and constructors directly, rather than isolating them behind a data abstraction. So the bottom of the slide lists a summary of the causes of these problems, that is, the things we should probably change to build a more flexible system. So let's take another run at trying to build a symbolic differentiation system. Let's create a new implementation that takes advantage of these lessons. In particular, we need a better top-level design decision based on types of expressions. We'll use con to handle our decisions based on types, giving us more flexibility than having just two choices at each stage, which is what an if assumes. And we'll isolate our data representation from its use by building a true data abstraction with an abstraction barrier between the user and the implementer. If we are going to use con to handle the dispatch to methods for different types, we'd like to have predicates that identify explicit types. So we'll gather together into a single procedure all the tests we need to identify a specific type of expression, for example, to determine if an expression is a sum. And we'll do the same thing for every other type of expression we want. While it is easy to see that we need to do this for compound expressions, note that we have an implicit assumption in our earlier implementation about the representation of simple expressions. For example, we have directly relied on the fact that a variable was represented as a symbol. But we should really isolate this fact and check explicitly for types of simple expressions as well. Thus, to check if an expression is a variable, we should actually first check that it is not a compound thing, then check that it is actually of the form we are using to represent variables, in this case, symbols. Note the use of the predicate symbol to do this. The second thing we need to do is truly implement a data abstraction. We need to eliminate the dependencies within the code on the explicit form of the representation. Thus, within the code, we should only be using constructors and selectors, which will shield the choice of representation from the use of the abstraction. Here, for example, is a constructor for some expressions, with one of the associated selectors. By creating this barrier between code that uses expressions, for example, derivative, and the actual representation, we're now free to change that representation. As long as the contract between constructors and selectors is preserved, the code that uses the abstraction will still work.
Obviously, we could complete this representation for sums, for products, and for any other expressions we want in our system. Now let's pull these new i's together into a better derivative procedure. The arguments are the same as before. The top level structure, however, has a different form. Here we have a large cond expression, where each clause dispatches on a different type of expression. Notice the nice form here. Each clause has a predicate that checks for the type of each kind of expression, starting with the simple expressions. Associated with each type is the method to apply to that type. Note for, in particular the form for sums. We use the selectors to get out the pieces. We recursively apply derivative to those pieces. Then we use the constructor to glue the pieces together into the correct form. So why bother to go to all this trouble? Since by doing this, derivative only uses selectors to get at the pieces, we're now free to change the underlying representation without causing any damage to derivative or any other procedure that uses the selectors and constructors. Let's drive this point home with an example. Here again is our original example, including the case where it seemed to return the wrong answer. Having separated out a clean date abstraction, we can fix this problem very easily without having to touch derivative. In particular, let's change our constructor. When we go to get a sum, let's first check to see if we can simplify the expression. So instead of just creating a list starting with the symbol plus, we'll first see if the two expressions are numbers. If they are, let's just add them together. Look very carefully at this. In the case that both expressions are numbers, we will return as the expression the value obtained by applying the operator associated with plus to those values. That is, we don't create a list here, we return a numerical value. In the other cases, we do return a symbolic expression, simply choosing to put the number first if there is one. The key issue is that we've only changed one thing in our system, a constructor. What happens to the full system? Well, it nicely gives us the change we wanted. In this simple case, it returns the value of the numeric sum. So to summarize, by isolating data representations from data use, it becomes much easier to make changes in the behavior of our system without requiring detailed and intertwined coding changes. This leads to cleaner code, which is much easier to maintain and modify.